Welcome, everybody. Um, this is the second session of day two of Virtual FoxFest. And uh, this will be what I hope is, a, is an interesting session for those of you who um, have maybe looked at all the different projects in VFPX. So um, this session is titled, What's New in VFPX in 2022? I did a session uh, four years ago in 2018. So this is going to be basically a catch up of all the things that are, that are new. Um, a little bit about me, for those of you who may not know me, I've written a number of, of tools over the years, uh, Stonefield Query and Stonefield Database Toolkit. Um, some of the things that come with Visual Fox Pro, the member data editor and, and so on. I uh, wrote a lot of articles over the years in various magazines. Um, written a number of books over the years. Um, as you know, I'm one of the organizers of Southwest Fox and Virtual Fox Fest. I'm also a co-administrator of VFPX. I was a Microsoft MVP for 15 years. and um, I was uh, given the Microsoft, uh, not Microsoft, the Foxborough Community Lifetime Achievement Award a few years ago. Um, if you are not familiar with VFPX, it is an open source site for Visual Fox Pro um, projects. Um, there are actually more than 135. At the time that I wrote this a couple of months ago, there were 135 projects. Now there's, I think there's three or four more since then. I personally use 30 of these in my Visual Fox Pro IDE and in applications that I create. So that I'm, I mean, that's you know, not only a fraction of what's actually available there. So what we're going to look at in this session is as many of the 20 new projects that have been added over the last four years as time permits. I'm actually going to only get to about maybe uh, 10, 12, something like that. The white paper has information on all 20 of the projects or most of the projects. Um, I'm not going to cover some of the ones that I cover in the white paper because I only have 75 minutes to do it. So we'll spend the first couple of minutes just as an introduction to, to VFPX. And for those of you who are familiar with it, it'll be probably just a refresher. Um, VFPX originally started on CodePlex, but CodePlex has, has since gone away. It's now located on GitHub, which is... Uh, if you're not familiar with it, is a huge open source um, site for different projects, different kind of languages, and so on. The best way to get there to um, VFPX is using um, the VFPX link. So if you type vfpx.org, it actually redirects you to this site here, vfpx.github.io. vfpx.org is obviously easy to remember. The VFPX homepage has some information about VFPX, and there are other pages as well. Uh, Posts, for example, has information about every time a new project is released, um, there's a new post about it. So the latest project is Bill Anderson's uh, Chillcat VFP, which I see I think I misspelled there. Um, but when you click on that link, that will take you to information about that project. But the most important page is the projects page. This is the one that lists all of the different VFPX projects. There are two different categories. Uh, a tool is something that would be used in the Visual Fox Pro IDE, not within an application, whereas component is something that you would include in a VFP application, whether it's for yourself or for customers or whatever. There's also a classification of status. So there's production, release candidate, beta, and so on. And this is determined by the, um, by the author or the, the manager of that project. So the projects are listed in alphabetical order. Each has a link that takes you to that project. And there are sort of two different kinds of things on this page. Official VFPX projects at the top, and then way down at the bottom, you see how many projects there are, tons and tons of projects. Way down at the bottom is a list of other open source VFPX projects. The only difference between these and what's considered to be a VFPX project is just that these weren't submitted to VFPX. They just happened to be an open source project that somebody created, and we added a link to the bottom of the page. So for example, uh, Christoph's um, Fox Crypto NG, um, if you click on this, that takes you to that particular project page. Um, it's just, it's not considered to be a VFPX project, but that's kind of a, a very loose distinction. So VFPX projects can either live under github.com slash vfpx or under the author's um, uh, repository. So for example, if we take a look at, um, uh, where is it here? If we take a look at, um, <laughs> there's a long scrolling list. If we take a look at bin um, to text e extension, this is uh, by uh, Lutz Scheffler. If we click on that link, 
it takes you to not github.com slash VFPX, but to his particular repository. So a, a project can live under either, either, either under VFPX or under that person's repository. Um, some of the things you can do when you um, come to their page is obviously you might want to start by, by downloading it. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. Um, you can click on the code button and then you can copy the link and then using Git, you can clone that repository. That would pull it, basically pull it down onto your machine and then you can do whatever you want with that. Um, if you don't use Git or you don't feel like creating cloning the repository, you can just click on download zip. That simply will download the zip file. Um, you then unzip it wherever you need to unzip it and you now have all the source code. And the code that you have is shown on this first code page. So you see all the directory structures here, all the individual, individual files. That's what you'd be downloading. Um, if there's a readme.md file, uh, md is a markdown file. If that file exists, which it does for virtually every project, then that will typically contain some documentation. It might be just an introduction. Maybe it's full documentation. It depends on the author. Uh, but you can see on Lutz's page here, for example, he has information about it and then a link to the documentation. Um, other things you could do on the page are if you have a bug report or want to request an enhancement, you can click on issues and then go and create a new issue to report issues about, about the, the thing you may have found. You can um, turn on notifications, so that way I haven't, I haven't signed into um, GitHub here, but I could watch this, for example. So that means that anytime there's a new release, uh, an issue created and so on, I'll get an email telling me about that. So that way I can keep on, keep on top of the, uh, of the project. Uh, forking a project means making a clone of it, not exactly a clone like on your desktop, but a, a clone that lives in GitHub as well. The idea there being that you've now made a copy of it, you could make changes to that copy, and then if you want to integrate those changes, or you'd like the, the manager to integrate those changes with um, the main um, uh, repository, you can create what's called a pull request. And then in that case, that would appear to the manager under the pull requests tab. And then he or she could merge those changes that you've made into the main project. So those are all the different things that you can do. And there's lots more, but we're not going to get into, into the, the basics of, of GitHub here. Doug, can you turn your camera off? Oh, sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> Now, the other way that you can get um, download uh, a uh, project is using Thor Check for Updates. And as Tamar mentioned when she talked about um, uh, Go Fish last week, if you're not using Thor, why not? Um, but so Thor Check for Updates will show us all of the projects. Well, actually, that's not quite true, but let me show you something here. So we'll go to Thor Check for Updates. Um, it takes uh, um, a moment or so. The reason is because it's actually going to, to uh, GitHub and downloading uh, one text file for each of the different projects um, so that can determine version information and download information and so on. Once it's finished, it displays this dialog where you can see the various VFPX projects. Um, whether you have it installed or not, for example, some of these automated build I don't have installed on my machine, but it shows the version number, and I could install it just by putting, clicking the check in front of it, and then clicking on Uninstall Updates. You notice, for example, that um, after Tamar's session on GoFish last week, um, a few changes were made, um, one by me and, and a couple by Lutz uh, in GoFish, so you can see that that, that as of a couple of days ago, there's a new version. And actually, uh, Luce has made a few more changes, has a pull request that I haven't merged in yet. So actually, probably by tomorrow or the next day, it'll actually be at version 5.1. So I do have these installed on my machine. Uh, some of them are updated, though. So I could click on, uh, you know, turn some of these on and then go and install updates. And it will go and pull it down. So you can either use this to install uh, a brand new copy or to update it to the latest copy. Now, a couple of things about that though. <clears throat> um, not all projects are listed. Um, the, the reason is because it was up to the project manager to put the information that would allow it to work with Thor check for updates in their project. 
It's also not exactly perfect because not all projects have been updated. Even though they may have a listing in Thor check for updates, if the version file hasn't been updated, it actually could be out of date. There, you know, it might be version 1.5 on GitHub, but the version file says 1.1. And so um, you can't necessarily rely on, on Thor check for updates. Really the best source is to go to um, GitHub and download either as either by cloning the repository or by downloading the code and unzipping it. All right, so let's talk about what's new in VFPX. As I mentioned, there are there were 20 new projects in 2018. Uh, since I wrote this uh, white paper in the slides, there's, there's been a couple more since then, actually, uh, including Bill's uh, uh, Chillcat VFP. So in addition to those new projects, though, there's a, a few other changes. Um, sadly, Matt Slay passed away a, a year ago. And so a couple of his projects, which were under his repository, GoFish and Dynamic Forms, those are sort of locked now. Um, because they were, because he was, they were under his repository, he's the only one who can merge pull requests, who can close issues. Other people can respond to issues, but, but nobody else can make changes to it. So what I did was I, I um, um, forked GoFish and Dynamic Forms and changed the links on the VFPX project list to point to the Fort project. So when you go to the VFPX project list and click on GoFish, it won't take you to Matt's repository. It'll take you to the GoFish repository under VFPX. And there um, we can make changes. Uh, we can, um, you know, respond to issues and, and so on. Um, the other change, of course, is that there's been lots of improvements in existing projects. Um, as I mentioned, there's been lots of changes to GoFish. There's been changes to Thor and to the PEM editor, um, VFPX upsizing wizard, um, just, you know, tons and tons of changes to existing projects um, over the last four years. All right, so let's take a look at as many projects as we can cover about, like I said, about uh, maybe 12 or so of the, of the 20 new ones um, in the time that we have left. So first one we'll talk about is Zint Barcode. Uh, the project manager creator for this is Antonio Lopes or Lopez. Um, it's a wrapper for Zint. Zint is a, a DLL that works with barcodes, generating barcodes, both barcode and QR codes. Um, it has a bunch of properties, a bunch of methods. You set the properties the way you want the barcode to look. You call some of the various methods to generate the barcode. Um, there are a couple of other projects that are similar to this on VFPX already, Fox Barcode and Fox Barcode QR. I actually use Fox Barcode, so I didn't have a need for Zint Barcode. But if you haven't used any of these projects and, and you do have a need for Barcode, take a look at, at uh, both Fox Barcode and Zint Barcode. Maybe you know check out the differences, see which ones you need. Let's go and take a look at an example. Um, I'm going to actually go to... Here. Okay, so let's open up this example. Oops, move it onto the right screen. Here we go. So um, here's a sample that comes with Zint Barcode that shows just simply how it works. So we do Zint Barcode.prg, which basically sets procedure to itself. We then create a Zint Barcode object and create an enumeration object. This allows us to use enumerations like this rather than hard coded values. So then we're going to say uh, of the Zint barcode object, we'll call set symbology and we'll set it to the barcode 39. So this will generate a barcode 39 barcode. And there are other properties you can set the size of it and, um, you know, whether it has text underneath it and, and lots of other things. It's all documented quite well on the on the GitHub page. Uh, let's open up the Northwind database and then we'll do a cursor from the um, the current product list view. So we'll grab the product ID and the product name, but also as part of the SQL statement, we'll call the Zint barcode image file method, passing it a product ID to generate an image. And then we'll just run a report. So let's just run this code. And here's the result. So we have this Northwind catalog and for each product, it has generated a barcode image, as you can see here. And I've got it zoomed up so that you can, you can see it properly. Um, so very simple way to create images or barcode images in VFP, VFP 
that can be used in forms and reports and you know anywhere you would need to use a barcode of any kind. Any questions about that? No questions yet. Okay. Fox Env. Uh, this was created by Erwin Rodriguez. It reads name value pairs from an ENV file. Um, so the idea is that um, if you have a bunch of settings that you want to use in your application, um, when you read those settings, they're actually created as properties of an object. So now they're easy to address in an object-oriented uh, syntax. It supports multi-line values, so not just a single, a single value, but multi-line values, which is useful. It supports comments, so in the, in the text, you can read information about it without actually it being part of the value. And it supports automatic date, date, uh, data type conversion. So numeric values become numeric, even though they're stored in an ENV file, maybe as text, um, they would be automatically converted to date or numeric and so on. It doesn't support writing to the ENV file and it doesn't support encryption. So you would be responsible for generating the ENV file yourself and for encrypting and decrypting values. But it does read from the file and automatically stuff it into properties. So let's go and take a look at an example of that. So here we're going to generate some text. So I'm going to have uh, use my username. We'll have a password. Here's an example of interpolation. So this dollar sign means we're going to interpolate the string. That means that anything in between curly braces is considered to be a property or a, a variable and will be expanded into this. So this will actually become dhenig at stonefieldcurry.com because it will interpolate this, this, um, this username. Um, here's a value that is true, so it'll be stored as numeric. Here's a value that'll be numeric. Here's a multi-line value. So these three quotes at the start of the end of it indicate this is a, a multi-line value. So we're just going to now write those out to that uh, the settings.env file. Now we're going to read them back in again. So we'll do foxenv with the name of that settings file. That automatically creates a, a member of underscore screen called env. And you notice that env has properties that make up, uh, that contain the values of those settings that we stored. So when I run this program, we can see here's the value of the username property of the underscore screen env object and password and email. You notice that use SSL, um, even though it contained a string true, it's converted to a Boolean value. And the same thing with port, it automatically converted that to a numeric value. And here's our multi-line value. So foxenv Fox is useful if you have settings that you want to persist and then restore when the application starts up. Any questions about that? Uh, yeah, actually, we have one for the barcoding. Okay. Um, do the barcode projects read barcodes as well or just generate? Just generate. Okay. And then uh, on the Fox Env, uh, it's, is there an override for the automatic conversion? For example, when your data looks like it's numeric, but you store it as character. Uh, I'm not sure about that. You'd have to, you'd have to check the documentation. That's it. All right, next one, UTC date time. Uh, this was also created by Antonio Lopes. Um, it handles UTC times. There are uh, a, very, a variety of uh, properties, a variety of methods. The most important ones are UTC time, which will give you the current time in UTC. Uh, local time, which would give you the, the current, you know, basically the equivalent of the date time function. So it gives you the local time and get time difference, which will tell you the difference between two date times, which could be in different time zones. So let's go and take a look at an example of that. <clears throat> so we're going to do utc.app. That adds uh, a member to underscore screen called UTC. So we're going to call the set time zone. I'm doing it here to, to set the, the Winnipeg time zone because that's where I live. Um, so then we'll call the now function. This will give us the UTC time as it, it'll basically convert from my local date time to what the time is in UTC. And then we'll just go and print that out. Then we'll go and do the same thing with the local time method. But local time can accept additional parameters. So here we'll go and get the local time in Vancouver. 
Here we'll go and get the local time in Toronto. By the way, these strings that I'm passing here, these are um, ISO um, values that are are uh, for various cities. You can download, a, there's an ISO file you can download that has the, the different values for available for the different time zones and so on. Um, and then we're going to also show that UTC time can accept a date time value. So this is the local time, 10, 15, uh, or 10, 05 on the, the 1st of October, um, and it'll convert it to the UTC time. Now let's go and convert our UTC time using T to C. So it'll convert it to the ISO 8601 format. Actually, let's go and run this, and then we can come back and take a look at, the, at what it's doing. <clears throat> So here's our UTC time as of right now. Here's the local time. Right now, here in Winnipeg, it's it's 11.50. That is 4.50 UTC time. In Vancouver, it's 9.50. In Toronto, it's 12.50. And the UTC for this particular date time value is this. Here is the TTC function showing uh, the current UTC time, but in the ISO 8601 format. Um, here it is by passing a comma one. Here it will actually show the name of the time zone. So it's showing CDT, Central Daylight Time. Here it is using RFC 8, uh, 2822 format. So by passing a different value here, we're telling it we want to display it in a different format. Now here is the opposite. We're going to take a date time value as a character string and convert it to a UTC time. So here's one using RFC 822 format. So this long, this long text string here. Here's one using the ISO 8601 format. Let's convert those back into a valid date time value, but again to, to UTC time. And here it is here. Finally, let's do some date time math. Let's say that um, Air France Flight 22 is leaving from Paris de Gaulle at this particular time, local time, and it arrives in New York JFK at this particular local time. So now let's go and get the time difference between those two. So we're passing a bunch of parameters here. We're passing in the departure time in local time and its time zone and the arrival time and its time zone and then just displaying the results. So you can see here that it departed at 836 and arrived at 1145. So even though that looks like it's only a three hour flight, but actually it's 8.15, it's eight and a quarter flight, hours flight because of the difference in time zones. Any questions about UTC? Uh, no. Fox Regex, uh, another project created by Erwin Rodriguez. This is a wrapper for the VB script Regex um, uh, object. Uh, so you might be wondering, well, why would I need it? I could just instantiate the VFPX script Regex object. Well, we'll, we'll talk about why you might want to use this instead in, in just a moment. So what you'll do is you'll set the pattern property to a pattern that you're looking for. You might set some other properties, such as whether it should be global or not, um, case sensitive, and so on. And then you'll call either test or execute. Test determines whether the pattern was found in the string that you specify. Execute would actually parse it and, and, and split up the matches. It supports string replacement, so not just searches, but also replacement. Now, why would you want to use this um, instead of just using the, the VFP script regex uh, directly? Well, the, one good reason is because it provides a whole bunch of built-in validators, um, URLs, email addresses, dates, uh, credit card formats, and so on. So let's go and take a look at an example of that. <clears throat> so again, let's just run this, and then, and then we'll take a look at the results and, and, and see what happened. So um, first thing we get is a cursor where we've um, broken down all of the words in a string and put it into a cursor. We'll come back and look at the code for that in a second. And the rest is all output here. So let's look at how we did that. So we're going to create a, a regex object from this foxregex.prg. We'll set the pattern to VFP, and then we'll do a test for the in the string VFP rocks, does this pattern exist? Well, it returns true because the, the VFP does exist in this string. Now we'll set it to, we'll set global to true. We want to match all occurrences, not just the first one. We're going to make it case insensitive. And the pattern we're going to use is 
white space, which could be a space or a tab or nothing at all, followed by a word, followed by white space. We want to create a cursor, and the cursor name will be matches, and it'll be in the default data session. So then we call the execute method. So we're going to tell it to look for all of the words in the mouse and the cat. That's what created that cursor. So we select that cursor and browse it. That's why we had a cursor with each word appearing in its own record. Now let's do the same thing again, but this time we'll set use cursor to false and we'll do the exact same thing. Now what we're going to get is rather than a cursor, we're going to get a collection. This LO matches is a collection. And for each item in the collection, let's output the value. And that's what we have over here the mouse and the cat. So each word is in that collection. Next, we'll draw a replacement. We'll set the pattern to cat. We'll set the string to the mouse and the cat, but we'll replace it because we're calling the replace method. We'll replace the pattern cat with cheese. And so when we call that, we get the mouse and the cheese. Here are the built-in validators I mentioned. For example, is this a URL? So it you pass it something, some string, and it will return true if it's a valid URL. In other words, it's doing its own pattern matching, but you don't have to know what the pattern is. Um, same thing with IP, uh, uh, IPv4, IPv6. Uh, same thing with email addresses. Same thing with dates. So here, for example, I'm giving it a date. I'm telling it what the format of that date should be. Here's a Visa number. Here's a MasterCard number. Don't bother writing those down. They're fake. Um, and you can see that all of these return true. That is, in fact, a valid URL. That is, in fact, a valid IP address, valid email address, and so on. So that would be certainly one good reason to use Fox Regex is if, and there's a lot more. Um, they're all documented, but there's a ton more built-in validators. So like I said, you don't have to go and figure out what the pattern is that you need to do a match for. Any questions about that? Uh, there will probably be because people are posting it uh, behind you. <laughs> There's a question about the um, time control. Okay. Uh, uh, how about Unix time? Um, I don't believe so. I'm pretty sure it's just uh, UTC. Okay. And that's it for now. Oh, wait. Nope. Uh, does is URL open the link? No. It's really just a validator. It's just checking to see is this a valid URL or not? Just by pattern matching. In other words, it doesn't it doesn't doesn't go to the website to see if it exists. It just checks whether it is you know does it start with HTTP or FTP? Does it have a colon? Does it have two slashes? Does it have a domain? Does it have a you know an extension? You know that kind of thing. Okay, and then another one. Um, what is the base language of the of uh, this regex class? Um, it's using it's using um, the regular expressions. So in other words, it's you. It basically instantiates the VB script regex object, um, and then and then you. So it's not using any language. It's using regular expressions. That's that's what it that's what it's using. Okay. That's All right. Foxmock. So this was created by uh, Christoph Olenhaupt. It allows you to create mock objects. If you've worked with um, um, uh, .NET, for example. Uh, testing is very, very, very popular, much less popular, unfortunately, in VFP, but testing is very popular in the .NET world. But one of the, one of the issues when you create uh, unit tests is that sometimes your objects have to collaborate with other objects. And you don't really want to test those other objects. You want to test object A, not object B and C that it works with. Well, let's say that object B um, you know, sends an email or connects to a database. You don't really want that to happen. You don't want to have an email sent every time you, you run a test. You don't want to connect to the database, which may not exist in the test environment. So what you really want to do is you want to mock the behavior of those collaborative objects so that they, they return or, you know, return to the object under test a true or a false or a numeric value or whatever they're supposed to do as if they had worked, but they don't actually work. They don't actually do anything other than return some kind of value or, or you know, change some kind of state or something. So as you could probably guess, FoxMock was intended to work with FoxUnit, which is the, the main foxing uh, testing framework for, for VFP applications. Before we look at it, one really cool thing about Foxmock is that it uses something you see a lot in the .NET world, but um, 
I don't think I've ever seen it used anywhere else in the VFP uh, VFP world. And that is a, what's called a fluent or a chain call syntax. For example, we can say mock. Obviously, mock is, is an object. Mock dot new dot call to some string dot return and so on. This kind of syntax you you pretty much never see in in VFP applications. This 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 fluent syntax. So that's kind of a, the way that uh, Christoph did that is is actually is actually pretty cool. So uh, let's go in and uh, do this. I'm going to go to Thor Applications Fox Unit and open up Fox Unit. And I've already got it loaded with with the test mock. We're not actually we're not actually going to do any tests. I just want to show you um, uh, a sample that Christoph created that that demonstrates how you could use uh, these mock objects. So it's not actually going to do any testing. It's just creating mock objects themselves. So um, if you're not familiar with Fox Unit, there is well whether you are or not, there is a um, a setup method that's called on every test and a teardown method that's called on every test. So in the setup method, we're going to create a public object, a mock object, from the foxmock.prg. And in the teardown method, so when the test is done, we're going to call its cleanup method and then release it just to make sure that everything is cleaned up. So there will be a, 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 an object called mock to all of our tests. So here's a real simple one. Um, we're going to say mock.new. So this will create a new object for us and store it into the LO obs property. However, we're going to tell it that it's going to have a property called LDebug mode, and its property is going to be set to true. So even though we don't have a class that creates a, uh, um, this LO obj object, and that class doesn't exist, and if it did, it didn't, it wouldn't have an LDebug mode property. But this creates a new object from scratch gives it an LDebug property and sets that property to true. So now I can go and do something with that mock object. For example, I can attach it to the object under test. Um, so that way, you know, it can, it can do its testing things without having any behavior of the mock itself. Here's a, here's a basic method. Let's create a new object. It's going to have a method called admin, and that method will always return false. So when we now we can say lo object dot is admin and then pass it some string and it's going to return false. And again, the idea is that we're not th this test shows that the mock works. That's not how you'd really use it. You would use this object, this mock object in collaboration with the object that you're actually testing. Here's one that will return an object. Um, here's one that will um, you know generate an array. Here, here we can show we can change the property. So again, new object, it will have a C test property that initially is set to XX, but will change it to YY. Um, here's how you can check that a, that a mock object was, uh, was called. For example, let's say that we have a, a database object. We want to make sure that it collaborates, or sorry, we have a, a customer object. We want to make sure that it collaborates with a database object and calls its get customer method. We don't want to have a real database object that does anything. We just want to make sure that the object under test calls the get customer method of that database object. So here we're going to create a new mock object. It's going to have a method called test, and we're going to expect that somewhere that method will be called. So when we say verify all expectations, this will actually throw an error if that mock method test was not called. So now we can test to make sure, did my customer object call the get customer method of the database object? If it didn't, that test will fail and so on. So I'm not going to bother going through all these, but you can see there's lots of different examples of different things that you can do, um, much more complicated examples of things that you can do with Fox Mock to create mock objects and use them in your, in your testing. Any questions about Foxmock? I think the audience is stunned into silence. <laughs> All right, let me see how I'm doing for time here. Uh, check my check my schedule and see if I'm on schedule. I am. I'm right on schedule. Okay. Next one is Fox Faker. Uh, another yet another project by Erwin Rodriguez. Um, this one generates fake data. 
Now, your first thought is, well, I can use that for testing. I could use this maybe in, in conjunction with Fox Unit, maybe Fox Mox, and I can use it for test data. But you can actually use it for lots of other things as well. You can use it for demos, for example, where you don't want to show real customer data. You want to show some sample data. Um, maybe for training purposes, you're training your customers. You don't want them hitting the production database. You want to have them hitting a test database. Um, I have kind of a, a funny story to tell related to this. Um, many of you probably know... Um, Mike Feltman from um, from F1 Technologies. Um, he told me a story about, oh, maybe 15 years ago. Um, his brother, Phil, was responsible for generating uh, fake data that they could use for doing demos and for and for training and for samples that, you know, that would they would use with with their Fox Express framework. Um, so if you've ever met Phil, you know that he's uh, he's kind of a funny guy. Well, because there must have been a miscommunication between uh, Mike and Phil, because Phil thought that the data that, that he had to create was for internal purposes, for testing only. So he used some colorful names, names that I can't repeat here, names that, you know, really you wouldn't expect to see in, in sample data. Well, Mike wasn't aware of this. I guess he didn't take a look at the records that Phil had created. So they actually included that with a sample application that went out with Visual Fox Express. And to their horror, they discovered uh, that when you ran the sample application, you saw a lot of unprintable uh, and, and unsavory names in their sample database. So this would allow you to avoid that kind of embarrassing situation by generating fake data. Uh, Fox Faker has a lot of different methods to generate numbers, dates, different kinds of text, names, addresses, email addresses, and so on. So let's go and take a look at an example of that. So here's a real simple example. We're going to instantiate the Fox Fake um, object from the Fox Faker uh, PRG. I'm just going to create a cursor here with columns for first name, last name, uh, title, company, email address, and so on. And then we're going to generate 20 records. So we'll add a new record, and then we'll replace ID with fake number between 1 and 10,000. We'll replace the first name with fake first name, fake last name, fake job title, fake company, fake street address, fake city, fake fake state, country, postcode, phone number, email. Uh, we'll replace the created date with a fake date. We'll replace a comment with fake text of up to 100 characters. Okay, so let's, and then we'll just browse that. So let's just go in and run this. And here's our results. So here we have an ID that's between 1 and 10,000. We have a first name, a last name, a title, company, address, city, region, country. And you notice that some of the regions don't necessarily mass country, mass match countries. I'm not sure that there's a region in Yemen called Tennessee. Um, uh, a postal code, a phone number, an email address, a date, and finally a comment, which is just some, some text. So we've got, we have 20 records that have these. If I run it again, now we have a different set of records, different names, different uh, email addresses, titles, and so on. So every time you run it, it'll generate, um, you know, as many different, in this case, 20 different records. So with this Fox Fake, um, Fox Faker, it has, like I said, a lot of different methods to generate different kinds of, of data. Um, I'm not sure if, if uh, a question has come up yet, where is this data come from? Um, it's pretty much built into the application. So if you need to go and, you know, add your own set, then you can go and, and specify, okay, here, here's an actual set I want to use for my own data instead. Any questions about Fox Faker? Uh, yes. Um, what format does it use for phone? Can you configure it? Um, I believe that it's really just pulling it out of uh, data that's built in. So I think you could probably just go and look at the source code and change it yourself. Okay. And then uh, is Fox Faker in Thor? Um, I don't believe it is. Um, so you can download it directly from the website. Okay. And has anyone built a SQL Server subclass? Not that I'm aware of. All right. That's it for now. Okay. Multi-select combo box. This is actually one of the one of the um, components that I actually use in, in an application. Um, it was created by Greg Wilcock 
Wilcoxon, hope I'll pronounce that properly. Um, it provides a combo style control that allow you to select multiple values from a list. Um, so in the screenshot here, you can see that I've dropped down this combo box and I can pick Alpha, Charlie, and Delta just by turning on checkboxes. Um, it's a lot more convenient than the typical list box where, for example, you have to hold down the control key or the shift key to select multiple values. <clears throat> the underlying control source uh, for this will actually store um, the, the values delimited with whatever, they can be delimited with whatever character you want. Typically, it's going to be a comma. But the idea here, for example, is that Alpha, Charlie, and Delta are actually stored as A, C, and D. And so they're expanded. It, you know, it reads from the control source A, C, and D, shows the full spelled out names in both the combo box and in the drop down list, but it actually stores it as the codes. Um, so let's go and take a look at that. So let's uh, run it first, then we'll take a look at the code behind it. So here, uh, you can see this, I, I took the screenshot from this. So when I click on the combo box to drop it down, I get a drop down list with column headings. So this sort of indicates that this is where, you, you know, you put a check mark in front of it, and there's a code and a name. If you don't like those abbreviations, those are um, under your control. They're properties that you set. So if I, for example, turn off alpha and turn on delta and epsilon, then when I click off the control, it is showing the full spelled out values, but the underlying control source is actually storing it as a C, D, and E. And if you wonder why there are quotes around it, again, that's under, under control. In the code I'll show you in a minute, it says, I want this as comma separated, and I want quotes as delimiters around each value. <clears throat> so let's go and take a look at how that was set up. So in the init method, um, you can see that, that uh, uh, this um, multi-select combo box was dropped on the form, and then properties were set. So the control source was set to the my cells property of this form, and you can see that was added up here with the values A and C initially. The column widths are set to 25 and 200. <clears throat> the first column will have a CD as its column heading. The second one will have N uh, NME as its column heading. <clears throat> And then our row source is going to be from a cursor containing the CDN NME value. So very similar to setting up a, a combo box uh, programmatically. It's just that it's going to be, in this case, it's going to be doing things a little bit differently. Here's another example. And so this one does have a column heading uh, in, in that grid that pops up. Uh, this one does not because the show headers property is set to false. So a slightly different control source. Uh, you know, similar similar values, same same row source. So when we run this again, um, you can see that this one has a um, uh, column headings. This one does not, just because of the setting of that property. Other than that, they these two work the same. So this is a, a this is a really handy control because a lot of times you have underlying codes that you don't want to see, you don't want the user to see the code necessarily, or maybe you do, maybe you want them to see both the code and the fully, fully spelled out one, or maybe you don't want them to see the code at all. Maybe you just want them to see the fully spelled out meaning of that code, but underlying that you want to store the code. So this allows them to see the full spelled out value, which you of course can do with a regular combo box, but also to give you a multi-selection without having to hold down the control and shift key, which are pretty cumbersome things to have to do when you're working with a, with a, um, a combo box. Any questions? Uh, lots of oohs and ahs, uh, but no questions. Okay. The next one is also created by Greg, um, and this is for doing tool tips. It supports multi-lines of text and balloon-style controls. So if you've used, um, a, a DBI has, a, has a, a tool tip control that allows you to you know, have much more um, complex tool tips than we have in VFP. Uh, Carlos Alawadi also has a balloon tip uh, control in his CTL32 library, but there's much less overhead with this. And instead of having the entire CTL32 library, which by the way, isn't even available anymore. Um, Carlos's website is offline. So if you don't already have it, you ain't gonna get it, um, or unless you get it from somebody else. But this is much less overhead. So it gives you basically the same similar features to that balloon tip control of Carlos's, 
but with much less overhead. So let's go and take a look at that. <clears throat> so we'll run it first again and then take a look at the code. So if I hover my mouse over this, we can see that here's a balloon style tool tip. It's much larger than the small yellow window that we get with a regular tool tip. Um, and it has a, sort of a balloon style. So it's got a, you know, a pointer to it. It was configured to appear not at the mouse location, but centered on the control. So that's why even though my mouse is over here, it's centered on the control. Here's another one. This one was configured to appear at the start of the control. Not again, not where the mouse is. Um, but you have control over the location and other things. And again, it's showing a balloon tip style. But no, you'll notice that we have an icon. We have a title in larger blue text. And we have um, the body of the, of the uh, tool tip in smaller, um, smaller black text. Here's when we generate on demand. So when I click on this button, it displays a tool tip with, again, icon, a title, and smaller text. Um, in the upper right-hand corner of the window. If I click it again, you can see how the tooltip was changed, and again, and again, and so on. All right, so let's see how that's set up. Um, ignore this one down here. We're not going to be taking a look at that one. But for the most part, there's only one. You don't have one tooltip control per control or per tooltip. You just have one for the form. In this case, there's, he's going to show his sample shows a couple of different things, and so that's why he's got two of them. But normally, you just have you drop one of these CTL tip objects onto the form, um, and then you register a control with that tooltip control. So in this text box, for example, in the init method of the text box, we'll say this form dot that control name dot reg tool, and then you pass it some parameters. The first parameter is an object reference to the the text box that we want to have a tool tip for when the mouse hovers over it. And then some some properties such as, you know, what is the position? So a one means that it's going to be centered, for example. What is the actual text? Here's a multi-line one using CHR10 to separate the lines um, and so on. So different properties, no zero means there's no icon. Two means that it'll show on mouse over on focus and so on. If we take a look at the second text box, um, here, it's again going to call reg tool for that same control. Um, we are going to specify that we want to have an, a, a big warning icon. So that's icon number five. Um, here's the text that will appear. Here is the, this is the, the, um, the title for the uh, tooltip text and, and so on there. And for this button here, for this command button, so this one on, oh, sorry, on the init, uh, we're going to register it again. So we're going to register this this with it, but it's going to be registered so that it's on demand only. So I have to click the button in order to, to be able to, you know, it's not going to pop up automatically by just hovering over it. Um, and so in the click method of the button, I'm going to call set text so to set the text of the tooltip and then call show tip. So that way it manually pops up when I do that. Um, there is a difference, but there's sort of two different kinds. There's the there's sort of the on-demand and the um, the not on-demand. Um, it's kind of a poorly, I think, poorly chosen uh, name. It really has nothing to do with whether it's on-demand or not. It's really kind of a style. So, you know, the if you set it to true, then it's one style of tooltip. Tool tip. If you set it to false, it's, it's a different type of tooltip. So it's not really, you know, on-demand or not on-demand. It's, it's really just the style of the tooltip. So, again, let's just run that again. And so here we get a, a multi-line tooltip, balloon style, centered on the text box. Here we get a balloon style, but with an icon and with a title um, at the left edge of the tooltip uh, of the of the text box. And here we have one that one only appears when I click, and it appears balloon style in the upper right-hand corner of the window. And we're changing the text on every clip. Any questions about that? Uh, just one, how extensive is the formatting available in the body of the tooltips? Um, not, not terribly. I, I, I don't recall now whether it supports HTML. I know that the, uh, the, the uh, DBI control supports HTML, so you can put, you know, kind of whatever you'd put in a browser window in there. I don't believe that this class supports that. I could be wrong. I'll, I'd have to look at the documentation again, but I'm pretty sure it's just pretty much straight text with, you can put in uh, multiple lines, but I don't believe it supports any other kind of formatting. Okay, and then one other question just came in. Is there 
a more generic centralized way to implement the tooltip versus adding control to each form? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I don't use this tooltip because I use uh, Carlos Alouetti's uh, tooltip instead. And what I've added to my base class form is I actually have uh, one of his tooltip controls. And in my base class text boxes, I've added a custom property. Does this use a tooltip true or false? And it automatically does, if that property is set to true, it automatically does the setup. So to, in order for, for me, in order to use um, Carlos's balloon tip control, I simply have to, to you know, create a, a, a form out of my base class form class, drop my base class text boxes onto it, and set the property, meaning that I want to use a balloon tip to true and fill in the, the text that I want to be displayed and optionally the, ca the title as well. So yeah, you could definitely do it in your base classes. If you use this all the time, definitely go in and implement it in your base classes so that you have much less work to do to set up on each form. Okay, that's it for now. All righty. Object Explorer. Uh, this was uh, pretty much the very last tool that uh, Matt Slay created. He and, and Jim Nelson collaborated on this. Um, it allows you to view members of an object um, and what object is up to you, but the most common way is that you'll launch it with a key press or a mouse click and it will display the, the members of the object that the mouse is currently over. Um, there's a sys function you can call that gives you that object and you pass that to the object explorer so it'll show the control, the, 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 that control. However, it does drill through the control hierarchy. So as you can see in the screenshot here, although my mouse was over this text box when I launched it, and that's the one that is selected, I can see all of the members of the form. So I can simply click on a different one to see other controls on the form. The beauty of this thing is that it works in the runtime. So sure, you know, like why would I need this when I'm working at design time? I can just look in the properties window, right? Except at design time, whether you're running it in the IDE or just, you know, as an executable on the customer's machine, this allows you to pop up this, this window and see things about the various objects. Like, you know, gee, this window isn't, isn't big enough. I need to make it a bit, a little bit bigger. So I resize it, but now how big did I make it? I, you know, I, I don't know what the width and height are, height are because I changed them, um, you know, at runtime visually. You could pop this up, check the height and width properties of the form, and then change your code so that they, you know, at, the, at design time, use that, that new height and width properties. You can also change property values. So I can actually type, you know, type in the caption and change the caption at runtime. Like I said, not even within the ID, but actually at runtime. This is similar to, to uh, Tamar's object inspector. They just sort of took that idea and, and, and went a little bit further with it. So let's go and see how that works. Um, I've actually implemented in Thor. So um, I've got the F9 key um, uh, uh, configured to bring up Object Explorer, Object Explorer. So if we just open up pretty much any one of these forms here, actually, let's, let's go and run it, not just in the designer. Let's run it. I'll hover my mouse over this and then press F9. And so the Object Explorer comes up. And you can see that um, you can make it, um, you can either have it as a desktop only, so I could move it outside the VFP window. This one is not, so this one is just coming up um, inside the VFP window. But like I said, there, there is a desktop version of it available as well. And I can see all of the different properties of this. The ones that appear bolded are ones that were changed from the default values. I also have controls. I only want to see native properties. I, I uh, or don't want to see native properties. I only want to see inherited properties, custom properties, and so on. Uh, you can do a filter. So anything, for example, containing the word font, will only those that have the word font will appear. And I can change values. For example, if we go up to the form and double click this, I can change this to, and now it's changed the caption of the form. And like like I said, I could be running in an, in an exe, right? I'm, I'm running in the VFP, IDE, but this works in a VFP EXE as well. Now, obviously, you don't want to give this probably to all of your users. You might want to have some kind of special, you know, development mode that when it's turned on, then some hot key or mouse click brings this up. And so that way you can go and see the values of various properties of various objects um, right within the, e the running EXE.
Any questions about Object Explorer? Sorry, I was taking notes. Um, <laughs> there is... No, you are pre-anticipating people's questions, which people are thinking is spooky. So you're, you're good. <laughs> well, because they have the same questions I probably would have. Probably. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm, I am now a little bit behind time, so I'm going to do my famous shifting into fourth gear and speed up a little bit. Uh, Oop Reports. Uh, this was actually my project. It gives you an object-oriented wrapper for FRX reports um, at, at runtime. So you can programmatically create or modify reports. Um, as an example, uh, uh, if you use Craig Boyd's Grid Extras, it actually uses this to generate a report on the fly when you tell it that you want to preview or print a grid. So we'll go and look at a quick example of this. I'm not going to go through all the code. I'll just show you briefly how it works. So we're just to make sure that I'm not pulling a rabbit out of a hat, I'm going to delete the employee report FRX before we start. So there is no employee report FRX. I'm then going to instantiate an SF report file object, tell it that we're going to create an employee report.frx. It's going to have a summary band. It's going to use the Arial font by default. It's going to work in inches. We'll have a left margin of half an inch. We'll go and set the heights of various bands. And then we'll go and start adding objects to the report. So let's go into the detail band. Let's add a text object with an expression of whatever the this field name is, and we'll give it a vertical and horizontal position, and it'll be bold. For a, There's a general field in the employees table, so we will go and add an image to the detail band. We'll set the image source, we'll set the width and the height to two inches, and let's add a box around that. So it'll be 2.1 inches, so it'll be slightly larger than the image, so that we'll put a box around that. If it's not a general field, then we'll go and add a field to the report, we'll give it an expression of whatever the column name is. It'll be five inches wide at this particular horizontal and vertical position. We'll go and add a line to the report. We'll put some stuff in the page header and the date and the page number and another line, and we'll add a, a total to the summary band. So programmatically, you can see there's a, a bunch of code here, but programmatically, I am creating a report on the fly. So let's go and run that program, and remember this report may have existed, but as soon as this program runs, it deletes it right away. So this report that we see is actually going to be generated on the fly. And here it is. So um, oh, it looks like something isn't quite right. It didn't quite, this, quite create this at the right width. So let's just drag that out. Um, so here we have a title. It's in red, big font. Here we have a first name, last name. Here we have an image and so on. This was generated on the fly. When we run this, run this. Oh, sorry, I just have to close it. It runs automatically. So here's that report showing um, this report didn't exist two minutes ago. Oh, look, there's Tommy Shaw's sticks. I just saw him last night. So again, that's a way that you can generate reports or modify. You can modify reports or create reports on the fly at runtime. I went through it quickly, but any questions? Uh, stun silence once again. <laughs> All right. Well, if you're stunned by that one, the next two are going are gonna to floor you. Uh, SF Mail is another project I created. Um, it provides a way to send emails from VFP applications. There are actually lots of ways you can do uh, emails from VFP applications. You can use Rick Strahl's tools. You can use uh, Chillcat. There's, you can use um, um, CDO. Some of these things don't work anymore. Um, like CDO, for example, doesn't really support a lot of the newer things. Um, I created SF Mail because at the time, um, Rick Strahl's uh, email uh, utilities didn't support um, some of the features that I needed. He, he does now, but at the time I created this originally, um, he didn't. So that's why I created this. And I didn't have Chillcat at the time either. So um, it supports text or HTML body. It supports attachments, diagnostic logging. So if something fails to send, you can look at the diagnostic file and it'll tell you what the interaction was between your machine and the mail server. Every single message appears in that in a diagnostic file. It has adjustable security settings. And as of the most recent change, it supports modern authentication. Thanks to, to Matthew Olson for, for doing the work to, to do that. So um, you may be aware that starting in October, um, Office 365 from Microsoft, um, they kind of led us to believe that modern authentication was required. It actually turns out in a, in a recent posting from just a couple of weeks ago, it turns out that they're not changing SMTP um, to require modern authentication, probably because too many old applications would break. 
Um, but if you do have modern authentication, uh, if you do enable it, um, it SF Mail works with it. So let's go and take a look at an example of that. Really simple to use. You simply instantiate the SF Mail object, set some properties. So our subject is gonna be test email. Here's the body and you can see that there's HTML in that body. Uh, we set the username and password. I'm gonna read them from an INI file. The server is the Office 365 server using port 587. We'll set this, the uh, sender name. We're gonna send this email to one of my email addresses. And here's where we set the modern authentication properties. So you set the, the OAuth URL, OAuth client ID, uh, OAuth scope and OAuth client secret properties. Um, three of those I'm reading from an INI because they are client specific. One of them, the scope is is general to anybody, uh, anybody that's using uh, Microsoft Office or using uh, Office 365 to send emails. And then we simply call the send mail method. Uh, if it returns false, that means the email wasn't sent and you can look at the see error message property. But there's also a property that you can set uh, whether you want to use debugging or not. Um, or log, uh, a diagnostic logging, if you set that and you give it the name of the log file, it will write to that log file and you can take a look and, and see what's going on there. Uh, so if we, if we run this, okay, the message was sent. We're, we'll give it, a, we'll give it a, a few seconds um, and then we'll check my email. While we're waiting for that email to come in, uh, any questions about SF mail? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I did notice that there was one comment about Google. Um, I'm not currently supporting Google and SF Mail. Um, Google does use modern authentication, but they use uh, a three-layered authentication. You have to contact the Google server to get a, um, uh, I can't remember what they call it, uh, but you have to get basically a token that, you then use to get another token that you then use to actually do the sending the mail. The first one though requires uh, popping up a dialogue that the user sees. So you have to be able to control a dial, you have to be able to control um, a browser window to allow the user to log in to Google and give permission. That then returns you something that you then use to go get your token. That just seemed like it was going to be way too complicated to me, so I I, I bagged that doing that doing the Google implementation. But it definitely works with Office 365. And if somebody else wants to take on the Google stuff, then then be my guest. So let's go and take a look and see if that email arrived. And uh, let's just do do a send receive. And here it is. So you can see that it came in with uh, bold and red text. All right, any questions about SF Mail? No. Okay. All right, Error Handler. So this is another one of my projects. It provides a highly configurable and customizable error handler that you can add to any application. It supports logging either to a text file or to a DBF file, or in a subclass, you can make a log anywhere, SQL Server if you wanted to. It provides a localizable dialog, although you don't have to use this dialog. You can use any dialog you want or no dialog at all. Um, it, su it su supports notification to uh, developers or support people via email or support ticket. Um, the support ticket code obviously has to be written because every, you know, every support ticket system is going to be different. I use a support ticket system called HESC. Um, so we'll see, I've actually wrote some code that generates a support ticket against HESC. So we'll see how that works in a minute. It can optionally include a screenshot. So um, before, before it displays the dialogue or creates the support ticket or sends email, it will do a screenshot so you can see exactly what the user saw at the time that the error occurred. And it'll either be an attachment to the email or it'll be part of the support ticket. It also provides error recovery. Um, most of the error handler systems that I've seen did some of these, like logging and then displaying a message, but then you had to quit out of the application and start over again. That's pretty annoying to most users. You know, I'd done a bunch of stuff and I got to a certain point and then an error occurred and now I have to get out. With this error handler, under most conditions, you can stay in the application right where you were. Um, and so that's, I'm not gonna show you how that works, but but uh, let's go and take a look at a, a demo of that. So, um, where's my error example? 
So here we are going to instantiate a subclass of the SF error manager called test error manager. The reason I'm using a subclass is because it has the code that knows how to, how to um, create a support ticket. If we're in debug mode, then we will tell the error handler we're in debug mode and we're gonna use a different dialogue. So we're gonna use uh, a developer style dialogue rather than an end user style dialogue when an error occurs. We'll set some properties. What's the name of the application, the version number? Where do we want to log to? Do we want a screenshots to be taken or not? Do we wanna create support tickets or do we wanna have emails sent instead? Um, what is the person's name? I'm hard coding it here in a real application. You'd probably, you know, after the user is logged in, you'd set the C contact and C mail properties to the user's name and their email address or, or not. They have an option to fill those in, in the dialogue that appears. However, you do want to fill this in. Who do we contact when an error occurs? What's the name of the support person or the developer? So what's the recipient name? Um, and then the, the other mail settings, the mail server name, the SMTP port. As you can probably guess, this is using SF mail to actually send the mail. You can also specify a language for the resource file and the name of the resource file that's used for that dialogue. All right, and then we're just going to display a form. So let's go and run this, and, and well, let's just take a quick peek at the form. This form just has a button that's gonna cause an error by saying X equals Y, but Y hasn't been defined anywhere. So that'll cause a, a, a you know, variable not found error. So let's go and run this, and let's cause an error. Okay, so I have developer mode turned on. So we're getting a dialogue that has debug and retry methods. If I click on, on debug, it brings up the VFP debugger and now I can, I can go and try and figure out what would happen. I can go back, you know, set step, I, I can, you know, um, uh, change the, the next uh, uh, execution point and, and so on with all these things. Let's go and resume. Okay, let's go and change this now so that debug mode is false. So we're gonna get the um, end user version of the dialogue instead. Let's cause an error. And now, now we get the end user dialogue. As I mentioned, this is localizable or you can replace it all together with your own, your own um, dialogue. It automatically has the username and email address filled in. Those were properties, but if they weren't, then I could fill them in. I could put more comments. I can save a text file, but I can also click send. And when I click send, it actually will either do an email or a support ticket. In this case, it's actually creating a support ticket. So in just a second, we'll go and take a look at that support ticket. Um, and let me just go to my support site here. and bring that over so you can see it. Here we go. All right, so here is the, you can see by the time, it was just created a second ago. Um, so let's go and take a look at that support ticket. And it has um, a text file on it. And it has, and if we take a look at that text file, it has basically a complete error report. Error number, the variable, uh, you know, the error message, the call stack, all the different objects, yada, yada, yada. And it has a screenshot of what we were looking at at the time that the error occurred. I'm just gonna go and delete that ticket because I don't need it anymore. All right. <clears throat> So, and we can continue, meaning we, we stay in the application. We don't quit out of the application. The application, which is just this form, is still running. All right, any questions about error handler? Uh, no. Okay. The last one is ribbon. This is another one of my projects. Um, it gives you an Office 365-like ribbon control for your VFP applications. It supports regular and horizontal buttons, and I'll show you what those, what I mean by those. It supports drop-down menus and it supports themes, and it's just a kind of a cool-looking little thing. Let me show you a real app. I'm, I'm going to show you a sample of it in a minute, but let me show you an actual real application that uses this. Um, this is our our flagship products. Don't feel query, and you can see that here is my ribbon. So we have uh, a home tab, a data tab, a tools tab, a help tab. Nice colorful images on each tab. We have drop-down menus 
for some of the buttons. These are these here are regular buttons. These are horizontal buttons. So they appear as smaller little versions and those can have drop downs as well. So let's go and show you now an example <coughs> form. Um, well, let's go and run it. So here's my example form. And as I mentioned, you can have, uh, it supports um, drop-down menus and sub-menus. So here, for example, we've got lots of different sub-menus here. Um, these are different horizontal buttons and they can have their own menus. The, uh, uh, a, uh, a section can have not just buttons, but can, here's a text box, for example, in the button. Here's another, here's another tab and we have different controls here. And it supports different themes. So there's only two themes right now. There's colorful and dark gray. So those are the only two themes that are that are supported right now. But it's, they're just stored in files. So you could, if you want to create your own theme, you can do that as well. Let's go and just quickly take a look at the code that was used to create that. So you notice that I simply dropped a ribbon control on the form and everything is done programmatically. So here's the, and so there's going to be a fair bit of code here because there's a lot of buttons. But so here we're going to go with this .o ribbon. Let's go and add a tab. So that'll be the home tab. We'll give it a caption of home. Let's go and add a section to that. So that new section over in the in the uh, in the far left there. It's going to have a caption of new. It'll have a button that'll say new mail. And here's the image. And here's the code that will execute. In this case, just displaying a message box. Here's the code that'll execute when the user clicks that button. Let's add another button called new items which will have a caption of new items. It'll use this image. Now I'm going to call add bar so that this has a number. This has basically a menu underneath it. Each of them will have a, a, um, a an image, like a text a caption, uh, a method to call or code to execute an image and so on. So I'm going to add a bunch of bars to that particular button. And then I'm going to add a bar to a bar. So this last bar is going to have bars added to it. And then we'll go and add another section, the delete section. And then we'll go and add some horizontal buttons to it. So same as add button, but just add horizontal button. And some of these will have menus in them as well. So there's a fair bit of code here because I have, you know, quite a few buttons. For each button, you know, there's a half a dozen lines of code. So like I said, a fair bit of code here to set up the entire ribbon, but it's just straightforward code and, and it gives you a very nice visual if you like, if you like the ribbon style controls, it gives you a very nice visual control that gives you this kind of UI for your application. I actually allow my users to decide for themselves whether they want the old style menu and toolbar or whether they want the new style ribbon. And I simply, you know, instantiate a different form based on, on what their choice was. One has a ribbon on it, another one that has a menu and, and toolbar on it instead. All right. Any questions about the ribbon control? Uh, yes. Um, are there any dependencies to other projects for the menus? Um, uh, it does. Uh, uh, it does use. Um, I think it uses the SF. Uh, it uses another one of my projects, the SF menu uh, project uh, for for the the different uh, sub menu, like for the, for the those tooltip menus. Um, and it, I, if I recall, it, I also use um, GDI plus X for some of the visual things. Okay. Uh, is the ribbon, well, uh, maybe answer this. Is the ribbon form pure VFP, no ActiveX? Pure VFP, no ActiveX. And another question, can you use ribbon on underscore screen object versus a form? Yes. Yeah. You can use it on any form-like thing. So, yes, you can use it on screen, screen as well. Set to go. Okay. All right. Well, that was our that was our um, shallow dive uh, onto. Um, well, we covered about twelve different projects. I think we really just barely covered the surface. I really just wanted to show you some of these projects. So hopefully, you'll get excited about some of them. Find some that you think you could use. Download them and then read the documentation to figure out how they how they actually work. Um, as I mentioned, though, I mean, this was this was 20 new projects since 2018. There's, a, you know, 135 or probably about 138 new projects now. So hopefully if you haven't been digging into VFPX much, this will give you some inspiration to go and take a look at what's available there and try out some of these projects. So VFPX.org, 
Um, if you uh, if you want to contribute, make sure that you create issues to report bugs or enhancement requests. Last chance for questions. We're all out. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, if you need to, to uh, if you do have any questions, I'll pop over in just a minute to the um, uh, to the Q and A room in sessions uh, where I can do any other demos or talk about anything else. Please remember to fill out your evaluations, though. We use that information to to try and make our presentations better. So thank you very much. <laughs>